Hey you guys and welcome to Jeep Sheep TV. Today we've got a real treat for you. We got a video that has been requested like a couple times uh, for almost a year now and I'm finally making it. Also, it's a little chilly so I'm gonna put on a coat. Okay, without further ado, I will introduce to you what's going on this week. This week we are finally going to be talking about the cooling fans on this 1994 YJ, but the things you learn today you can apply to just about any Jeep or car. So settle up and let's dive right in. So I'm sure you're wondering why I waited so long to post this video. Over a year ago, I posted the video where I put the 4 liter throttle body on this 2.5 liter inline four engine and one of the top comments or the first comments was whoa what is that why do you have electric cooling fans and how do you put them on and i said no worries there's a video coming soon and that was over a year ago why have i been waiting well the first reason and honestly the best reason is because i screwed it up really bad i've actually filmed this video like two or three times now this engine bay was made for a much larger engine, and they put a tiny one in it. You take out that massive fan shroud, and now you can stand on the front axle. My fan states 80 watts, and I have a 30 amp fuse. Each time I'll film the video, and before I edit it, I realize that the fans are not presentable. The way I did them wasn't good enough. And so this video is kind of going to explain some of the things not to do because there's tons of resources on what to do out there, but not everyone talks about the mistakes they've made. And so that's what we're covering here. Before we jump into what not to do, first I wanna show you what this setup is and explain to you how it works. I have a smaller fan on the front here and I have a larger fan on the rear. This is called a push-pull system because one of these fans is pulling while the other is pushing. Now the reason why I don't just have one massive say Ford Taurus fan in here that I pull out of a junkyard which is a very popular mod and I think it's fantastic. The reason why I don't have that is because that dude over there I have an oversized transmission cooler. I was having issues where it was leaking at the radiator and the smaller cooler just wasn't keeping up with the demand by itself. So I bought a larger one and I deleted the lines going to the radiator. So because that is there, I cannot install a larger fan. So I have a moderately large fan on the back and a smallish fan on the front. So the first thing you'll notice is this is the factory fuse box. I've got a cover on mine. If you don't have a cover on yours, here's my little sales pitch. I've got covers up there. I collect them from the junkyard whenever I can find them. And if I have one, I'll sell it to you for a decent price. Anyway, so I have this cover on here, it protects everything from the elements. The side of your fuse box has these two bolts here. This red wire comes directly from your battery. And this bolt up here just connects to the, uh, plate as well. So you can notice I, I've got three different wires coming off of here. This is a pretty heavy. It was actually for uh, probably came out of a kit for installing subwoofers. They give you some pretty hefty wire for that. And I had a strand of it, so I used it. This is feeding everything in this box here. Inside this box, there's a relay and there is a relay L, S, large and small, and then each have a corresponding fuse. These are 10 amp fuses. The large fans are utilizing this switch. That is a thermal switch. That switch will connect, or it will conduct electricity after a certain temperature is reached. That's one fan. That fan will always come on when I hit a certain temperature, if it doesn't, it's either my switch or this, and I have a light that tells me this little wire right here 
is soldered directly into the power wire that goes to the fan. That wire, it just splices off. That goes into the cabinet, powers the LED. And that LED is all the difference in the world because this LED is wired to the output of the relay. And anytime power is sent out of that relay, it's going to power the fans and it's going to power this LED. The small fan is a different story, and I'm still debating how I want to do this one. The small fan works the exact same as before, except for it is tripped by a switch on my dash. That fan, which helps cool the engine, but more importantly helps cool the transmission, that fan I have on a toggle switch and I have control over it. Now, in the future, I would like to have that be able to turn on on its own, but I also want to have some way for me to manually turn it on. And what I'm learning is it's really important to have a manual option somewhere, not the whole system, but just something to where you can do additional cooling. I've also been playing around with the idea to just have it turn on when the car turns on, which isn't a bad plan. Now, of course, when you have power, you also need ground, and this is my ground wire, and that comes out as well and goes to a bolt that is welded into the body of my vehicle. Now, I will provide you with a wiring diagram so you can see how this all makes sense, because following the wires in here is not necessarily easy, and I understand that. Let's talk about the mistakes that I've made. So my mistakes fall under two major categories. The first category, being wiring mistakes. So this is poor soldering, this is picking the wrong wires, this is component selection, all of that. Wiring mistakes. And the second one is controls mistakes. How is it controlled, where is it controlled, and how does that affect when the fans turn on, if they turn on? When I first got these fans, it was to replace the clutch fan. The clutch fan, tried and true, works great, but it takes up a lot of space, the fan shroud was massive, and I, I, I was eating up a giant engine bay with a huge plastic fan shroud, so that had to go. We went down to the auto parts store, we grabbed a couple of fans, we grabbed some wires, and whiz bang, boom, we had fans. We wire both fans into one relay, and then that relay is triggered by a switch on the dashboard. That enters mistake number one. Mistake number one was the switch on the dashboard. I don't care what you're thinking right now, there will be a day you forget to flip the switch. You can watch your temperature very carefully, something will catch you off guard, you'll get out of the car, have a conversation with something, and your engine's overheating. Do not have all of your engine cooling capabilities on a switch that depends on you turning it on, because that's what I had and I overheated my engine on a regular basis, and I watched the temperature often. After having multiple mishaps of forgetting to trip the switch, I then got smart and I bought myself a thermally activated switch. Now you can buy these where they screw into the port where your computer pulls temperature off the engine. Uh, there's a couple different ways to do it. Lots of them are very good. My option actually kind of hinged on some switches I already had and so I had to be a little bit more creative. I took that switch and I put it right here between these two hoses. This goes to your radiator and this goes to your heater core. My switch would turn on at 160 degrees and at roughly 190 is when your thermostat opens and you're going to start needing cooling. And in between all of this rubber, uh, this area would hit 160 at the same time that uh, the engine was hitting its temperature. So that was pretty good. That worked out very, very well. But if I was going down the highway and I really didn't need my cooling fans, it stayed on because it stayed warm right there. And so then I moved it up here and I actually stuffed it into the veins of the radiator. And now as the wind passes over it, it will shut it off after a certain temperature and it will turn off my fans, which is great because you do not need your fans to be running if you're going down the highway and you have adequate airflow. That's just more strain on your alternator. Notice I'm directly below where the fluid comes in. Fluid comes in, goes down here, and the first thing it hits is these veins which transfer heat to my switch. So it's going to trip fairly early, which is good because like I said, it's at 160. I wanted to trip it like 190, but it's got air flowing over it. it. It works. There was a second mistake that happened in that setup. 
I said before, both fans were going to one relay. Fans draw a lot of power, and when you're pulling that much power consistently through a relay, it's going to die. I kept replacing relays, and instead of rewiring it, I just kept replacing relays as they would blow up. Now what happens if you don't realize that the relay isn't working? You overheat. The third mistake that I made was how I mounted the relay. In the original system, I took the relay and I just bolted it right to the wheel well and the wires were just kind of dangling off of it like this. Now surprisingly, this lasted for years through all kinds of abuse. And then, of course, at the worst possible time, bad news is one of the contacts to my electric fan came loose and we didn't notice it. And so the engine overheated and the radiator kind of burst on the bottom. The blade connectors finally wiggled free and they lost their connection entirely. So that leads into the solution, which is put your relays into a relay box. The relay box will protect it from the elements as well as minimize those vibrations and keep stress off of the wires. The fourth mistake that I made was having no indication in the cab as to whether the fans were on, off, or working at all. I was on the trail this time and I got helplessly stuck. I mean, helplessly stuck. And from outside the vehicle, I can see my cooling fan is running and so I'm doing good but my engine is overheating and I don't know why. Well, what had happened was this cooling fan was running, but the large one had died. For whatever reason, the relatively cheap cooling fan that I had bought years prior was no more. And there was no indication of this in the cabin. There was really nothing I could do about it at the time stuck on a rock. Now that situation is a little bit more helpless. There wasn't a lot I could do about my fan dying, but there was a lot I could do about knowing that it was dead. Like I showed earlier in the video, I put a small LED in the dashboard that would turn on when the fans were running and working properly. LEDs are incredibly inexpensive. And depending on the one you have, they operate two, three, five volts, something like that. And so all you need is just a little LED like this. It doesn't have to be that bright. As long as you can tell the difference, preferably in daytime, between it not on and it being on. So what I did was I took an LED just like this. I took the one lead out. I took a resistor. I wrapped it on here, a little bit of solder, a little bit of heat shrink on both. Ran this guy to the power, ran this guy to a bolt nearby. And I think I had the whole thing done in 10 to 20 minutes. Now you'll also realize that I said that this LED happens after the relay and so what it will tell you is that the relay is operating properly and not so much that the fan is so you still need to be watching your temperatures but at least you can be in the cab and troubleshooting another common mistake in any wiring but this especially is choosing the wrong wire size for the application something that you really need to be taking into account when you're building this system is how much power are they drawing in this case they draw I don't know, up to 10 amps or something like that. My fan states 80 watts. With 80 watts, 12 volts, I should only be pulling like six-ish. And you can look at charts and you can see if that amount of amperage is safe for that wire. In this application, I used 16 gauge wire. I have one fan on one color and the other fan on another. This way I can keep myself organized and again, I can troubleshoot because when you are on the side of the highway in the middle of the night in Colorado, on the mountain, I might add, and your fan shut off, you want to be able to troubleshoot very quickly. The last point here, as far as things to avoid, is if you're doing connectors of any kind, where you have to put the wire in and create the connector yourself, make sure you're getting every strand of wire in there. Because I had another situation where inside of my fuse box, I had a connector that I had made and I messed up just, just slightly and it created a hot spot on the wire. The wire melted and was no longer able to conduct electricity and it happened all before the fuse. And this one certainly is all melted. This one melted, not that one. So I wonder if it's actually a connection issue between the fuse 
and the wire. Not so much a wire sizing issue. This got really gnarly and the reason for that is in here. When I stripped the wire, I accidentally severed a couple of the wires and it created a theoretically smaller wire at this one point, which drew a lot of extra current. Current equals heat and it burned itself to bits, thus uh, disconnecting itself and it no longer conducts electricity properly, which is super bad. So I had to tear the whole thing apart and rewire it, which is never fun. Luckily, that one happened at home. We had a lot to cover in this video. I hope that you're getting what you need out of it. Of course, there's kits on Amazon or Summit or wherever where you can buy something that goes on to your radiator and it's got all the switches and the controls and tells you exactly what to do. Those are great. This is a situation where I tried to save some money, I tried to spend minimal, and my mistakes probably ended up costing me the same as one of those two to three hundred dollar kits. But if you follow these instructions, if you stay away from the things I've warned you of, you might be able to save a couple pennies. And especially if you have a custom setup like mine where you've got aftermarket coolers and things like that, sometimes the one kit fits all doesn't always fit all and you have to do something like this. There will be a link down below. I think the link's going to take you to either the Facebook page or a Google page. However, I can get this document to you, but the wiring diagram will be in there. I encourage you to follow along with that. If you have questions, throw them in the comments and also just in general, browse through the comments. I have had so many incredibly intelligent people come in here, tell me, all sorts of auxiliary information about the project I'm doing. Sometimes they call me out on things I'm doing wrong. Sometimes they just give me more and more information. I've learned so much from it. So go and look in the comments. Hopefully someone has gone and just exploded their thoughts all over the comments for you to learn from. And again, like I said, if you have questions, I usually respond to the comments. I'd be willing to help you out. If you're struggling with the wiring side of it, the soldering, the blah, blah, blah. I have a video on my channel page. It's, I think it's how to wire an outlet that goes through a lot of those things and some of the tips and tricks I've gained along the way. Like I said, I value your time. So get out of here, go work on your Jeep, have some fun. Uh, thanks for stopping by. And in the meantime, I'll see you on the trail. She'll think so too And she'll be coming back, coming back, coming back